Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from he who is and who was and who is to come, the first and the last. Amen. Dear fellow believers in Christ, have you ever heard the phrase, what's in a name? Or maybe some phrases that are kind of similar like, don't judge a book by its cover, or a rose by any other name. They're all phrases that basically refer to the fact that just because we call something a certain name, that doesn't mean that it always lives up to it. Not everything is what it claims to be. And we all know this. We're all Americans. It's the heart of shopping season right now. You turn on your TV and you'll see a car commercial. There's really a lot of car commercials. You'll see a car commercial and they'll say it's the biggest sale ever. Now that's a pretty, it's a pretty big name for that sale. But as we all know, that's not really, it doesn't really live up to that. It's a sale, but maybe not the biggest ever. You walk past the cafe and you'll see best burger in the world. That is quite the name. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the best burger in the world. We're used to this. We're very used to this. Names don't always match up with reality. In fact, that's part of growing up. That's part of what we want to teach our children, to be discerning, to understand not everything gives what it promises. I learned this lesson the hard way. I was about five years old, and we were celebrating Christmas, and an extended family member, who I will not name, brought a fruitcake that I'd never, I'd never seen this dish before, and I saw it, you know, this large, dark, breaded thing, and I asked my dad, what is that? He's like, oh, it's a fruitcake. And to my five-year-old mind, I was like, oh, great, fruit, I like fruit, I like cake, Put them together, this is going to be great. And the five-year-old version of me rhymed. But I was like, oh, great. This is going to be awesome. So I took this huge clump, and I ate it, and then I wasn't happy anymore. I don't know what was in that cake, but it wasn't fruit. <laughs> From what I could tell, it was a combination of three-day-old bread, brandy, and breath mints that had all been thrown together. But I learned my lesson. The name threw me. I thought I knew what I was getting. That's not what I ended up getting. Brothers and sisters, I bring this up this morning because in our text for today, the Apostle John names Jesus. He gives him a lot of names. He ascribes a lot of things to him. In fact, our verses are, you could say it's one big long name for Jesus. And here's the thing. Jesus always lives up to his names. Always. So I say to you this morning, look at your Savior because he is always exactly who he says he is. He always does exactly what he says he's going to do. He always lives up to his names. Now as we look at our text, this is Revelation chapter 1. Verses 4 to 8. So we're right at the start of the book of Revelation. We're literally just four verses in. This is right at the start of the book. And as many of you may know, Revelation is a book filled with visions. Some of them startling. And the main arc of Revelation is God using these visions and giving them to John to kind of describe how the church will fight and fight, and Satan's going to oppose it, and they're going to keep fighting, but Christ will come in the end, and the victory will be sure. That's kind of the main point of Revelation and all those visions. And here in our text, it's like an introduction. If you want to think of it that's, that way, these verses are an introduction to the book of Revelation, and John is describing the main character in his book. And look at all these names. 
Listen again how he talks about Jesus. All these names. He who is and who was and who is to come. The faithful witness. The firstborn from the dead. The ruler of the kings of the earth. The one who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. The one who made us to be a kingdom and priest. The one who's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. The Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. Who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. Name after name after name after name. John pulls out all the stops and just showers Jesus with all these names. Describing who he is and what he does. And there is a lot there. And yet in all these names, there's something John wants us to notice. In all these names and all these things that describe Jesus, there's one thing that John wants us to pick up on. And that is the fact that Jesus is truthful. He's truthful. He does what he says he's going to do. When he tells you something, you can believe it. And if you, want, if you looked at the verses and the way they flow, John keeps this theme going. The first verse, the very first name we get is, He who is and who was and who is to come. That is the name of ultimate truth. That's what that name is, ultimate truth. I'll come back to it in a second. But right there, that's what John says. Then he calls Jesus in verse 5, the faithful witness. His testimony is true. You can believe what he says. Then, at the end of verse 7, when he's talking about Jesus coming back, if you see it in English, at the end of 7, it says, So shall it be. Amen. In Greek, it's just two words. It's yes, yes. True, true. And then what's the last name in our text? He who is and who was and who is to come. The name of absolute truth. John is taking great pains here to tell us that this Jesus, this, this one who is all these things, he is truthful. You can believe what he says. I talked about that name. He who is and who was and who is to come. You may have heard it before many times. It's how I open all my sermons. And that's for a reason. That name of Jesus, when Jesus calls himself that, Jesus is claiming that he is ultimate permanent truth. If you want to think of it this way, that name kind of corresponds to the Old Testament I am. I am who I am. Those names are saying the same thing. When Jesus says, I am the one who was, what he's saying is that I always was. I am the one who always was. When Israel walked over the, Dead sea, or the Red Sea on dry ground, I was. When Abraham came to the promised land with his wife Sarai, I was. When Adam and Eve were sitting in the garden eating pomegranates, I was. I never was not. I always was was always and when he says i am the one who is he's saying the same thing i always am i am never not i always am and everything that is is because i am that's what jesus is saying why does fire burn because i am why is the sun why does the sun shine because i am why is the sky blue because i am I am the one who always is, who always is. And then he says, the one who is to come. I am the one who will always be. I will never not be. I will always be. 50,000 years from now, or however you measure time, when we're all in heaven feasting, Jesus will still be. He will still be with us. This name of Jesus, the one who is and who was and who is to come, he is the ultimate permanent truth. Everything else compared to him is a shadow. He is the permanent one. He is the ultimate truth. 
and he guarantees everything he says to us. And now, brothers and sisters, it is a very majestic text. I mean, these verses are fit for a king. The names, everything being said about Jesus, and yet there is one small little sad spot. If you look again at verse 7, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. When this one, the ultimate truth, the Savior who washes away the sins of his people with his blood, when this one, the Almighty, the faithful witness, when he finally comes back, all peoples will mourn. They'll cry. They'll weep. If you're like me, when you, pe when you first read that sentence, it's like, what? I expected it to say, all peoples will be blessed, or all peoples will rejoice. But no, it says, all peoples will mourn because of him. And why? Well, because they love the shadows more than the one who is. They turned their back on him. They didn't believe the one who is faithful and true. When Jesus comes on the last day, his people, the people of God, will rejoice, but all, everybody else, all the world, will mourn. Now, dear friends in Christ, there's so much here in these verses in these names. I could probably stand here for eight hours and talk continuously, but nobody, that would not be fun for either of us. But there's so much here. So much is being said about Jesus, and yet that spot in the middle, <coughs> this one who saved his people from their sins, who is coming again, the faithful witness, firstborn from the dead. When he finally comes back, everybody will mourn. <coughs> and that's the thing here. Is that the vast majority of the world loved the darkness more than the light. They loved the shadows more than the one who is. And what is very dangerous about that is that that attitude affects us. <coughs> It always has and it always will. As long as we are on this pilgrimage in this earth, it's going to affect us because we have a sinful heart who also wants to turn to the darkness and the shadows. The lusts and the desires and the temptations of this world. It is so easy for them to worm their way into our hearts and our lives. And the thing about it is they never give you what they promise. You remember Proverbs chapter 9? Folly. She sets out her meal and tries to copy wisdom. She tries to tell you that her meal is full of good things, but there's nothing there but death. The temptations of sin always tell you that they're going to give you something, but there's nothing there but death. They always do this. Sex is something to be enjoyed. And, and you, all, you, all you'll get from it is pleasure and satisfaction. No, that's not what you get. What you get is guilt, remorse, division, selfishness. They never give what they promise. It's the name game all over again. And brothers and sisters, it is such a danger for us to act more like the people of the world who love the darkness and the shadows, to act like the people who will mourn when the one who is comes back. And yet, dear friends, in spite of all of that and all the times we are guilty of doing that, I remind you to look at your Savior because he always is exactly who he says he is. He always does exactly what he says he's going to do. 
every time. When he says that he loves you and he has saved you, he means it. He always lives up to it, every time. The one who is and who was and who is to come, the eternal one, loved you so much that he reached out of eternity onto this world for the sole purpose of changing the trajectory of your existence. For the sole purpose of changing the trajectory of your life. The one who is and who was and who is to come. The one who was, who always was, loved you so much that he became the one who was born of a woman. The one who is, who always is, loved you so much that he became the one who is dying on a cross while people spit on him. The one who will be, who always will be, became the one dead and buried in a tomb. He became all of these things because he saw you and loved you and he wanted to change the course of your life. And so he did. He did what he said he would do. And look at how he has changed us, how he's changed our existence. We are a people who were born in sin. Now he has made us a people who were saved by grace. We are still sinners. We are people who still struggle and still lose to temptation many times. And yet he has also made us the people who are victorious over sin, death, and the devil. We are a people who would have been condemned to hell because of our sin. And yet he has made us a people who will be in heaven always with him. He has changed the entire course of our existence. And he has done it all with his blood. Finally, brothers and sisters, look to your Savior, your Christ, your King. He is exactly who he says he is. He does exactly what he says he's going to do, and he always lives up to his names. Always. Every single time. So finally, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from he who is and who was and who is to come the first and the last. Amen. Would you